I'm Harville Hendricks. I'm Helen McKelly Hunt. And you are listening to The Soul of Life. Which is awesome. We know you'll enjoy it. At the time, there was Morton Downey Jr., this loudmouth, crazy, chair-throwing kind of show on TV. Today on The Soul of Life, I speak with Hari Srinivasan, anchor of PBS NewsHour Weekend and a senior correspondent for the nightly program. And you also had Discovery at PBS. I ask Hari what it's like to work for a news organization on a network that values education over sensation. So the, the broccoli growers of America are uh, livid every time that they listen to this part of your podcast. In an era where emotion-driven reporting is used to drive revenue. The average PBS viewer, NPR, our listener, they can reconcile an idea from their reality without having to throw something at the television. We talk about how Hari's role in his family as an English speaker contributed to his appetite for journalism. I was the code switcher for the family and I was the translator. So we would watch World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. I would essentially be sitting kind of next to the TV and translating in near real time I never in my wildest dreams would have imagined at that time that I would meet him and work with him. I share with Hari about my overwhelm with the speed of the 24-hour news cycle and my relief and appreciation for how informative his own Twitter feed is, including an emotional story I got pulled into about the first ever fan being inducted into the NBA Hall of Fame. Uh, You know, this guy's not even six foot tall with the turban on, never played a pro game in his life, and he has a championship ring, and he has an NBA Hall of Fame ring. Hari shares about interviews he's done that really stand out the most to him throughout his career, like his account of speaking with Marxist philosopher and activist Slavoj Žižek. My hair, like, standing on it, all frizzed out, like my fingers went into an electrical socket, like, that still stands out. I asked Hari about working alongside Judy Woodruff and the late Gwen Eiffel. We've not seen... Gwen and Judy have that much fun together, like, just as people. And the legendary Jim Lehrer. He had like a bus call that he could do from memory of all these little towns in Texas, and he collected bus paraphernalia and signage of greyhounds. I mean, his whole office was like a giant sort of bus museum. Welcome to The Soul of Life. I'm Keith Miller, and this is episode four of season three with Hari Srinivasan. My grandmother would literally scream from the balcony. My grandson's gonna be on TV in five minutes. Your channel better be on this. I'm Keith Miller, and my podcast, The Soul of Life, is here to help you remember who you really are. I'll bring together people who have gotten off their treadmills. I'll have conversations with athletes, musicians, doctors, scientists, healers, and entrepreneurs to discuss the fascinating edges of our knowledge in neurobiology, psychology, and physics. This is The Soul of Life. Have you ever been in a position where you know that you or your family member really needs emotional support or marriage enrichment, but you find out how expensive it is to get access to high quality out of network professionals? Well, I've created the Soul of Life community just for this. At community.souloflifeshow.com, you can join for free and be part of a network of caring and supportive people having conversations that can bring healing to your soul. It's there that you'll find access to psychoeducational courses to deal with stress, anxiety, and relationship conflict. For example, right now I'm offering a seven-week immersive course for couples called Mindful Marriage that walks people through a mindfulness-based stress reduction curriculum I designed that really gives couples in conflict a map towards stability, trust, and deeper intimacy. Just go to community.souloflifeshow.com, check out the courses, and join for free to be part of the Soul of Life community of learners and soul seekers. Hari Srinivasan has been an anchor on the PBS NewsHour since 2009. He is the anchor of PBS NewsHour Weekend and a senior correspondent for the nightly program. He's a contributor to Amin Poor and Company with CNN International and PBS also has a a YouTube channel called Take on Fake. Prior to joining NewsHour, he was at CBS News reporting for the CBS Evening News, The Early Show, and CBS Sunday Morning. Before that, he served as an anchor and correspondent for ABC News, working extensively on the network's 24-hour digital service, ABC News Now. Hari also reported for World News Tonight with Peter Jennings, Nightline with Ted Koppel, and anchored the overnight program, World News Now. Srinivasan received an Emmy Award for a story on gold mining by children in the Philippines and has been previously nominated for work from PBS NewsHour, Frontline, and for his work 
during his time at CBS. Hari, nice to see you. How are you? Good. Just taking it one pandemic at a time. Yeah. Can we not have multiple pandemics going on? <laughs> yeah. It's so yeah. It's, it's been a, it's been a rough year. It has been. How have you, have you been getting through it? I, I know, um, you know, sometimes we've had to take a break from the news in our house, just like turn it off, turn it off. You can't turn it off. Can you? No. And, you know, besides the pandemic, there's also been the sort of social upheaval, the racial reckoning that we are also living through. So these have been, um, you know, as they say, interesting times. I mean, that's that's great for journalists because there's always a good story and there's lots of um, things to cover. But it's been just difficult as a citizen, a human being, because you put your news hat on and you do your work. And then at some point, uh, you come home and you take it off. Well, we're at home, so you just take it off. Yeah. And then if you uh, spend any time in Maryland, as I do, we've got these cicadas, these little big bug-eyed creatures yeah. that are in the billions around us, which I kind of find interesting and intriguing because I love biology, but not everybody feels that way. <laughs> no, I saw, I, saw, I saw my Google feed had uh, somebody has figured out ways to put cicadas on cookies, like yeah. as a crunchy topping. Oh. oh, I wouldn't do it as a topping. I could see like... Okay, we, we, we should just leave that. <laughs> We've gone on a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> we should leave that. Um, you and I met a couple of years ago when I was when you interviewed me for the Weekend News Hour segment, a uh, short story about Maddie Corman's play, Accidentally Brave, which was a one-woman off-Broadway show about her experience with her husband who was arrested. He's a Law & Order producer, um, and they're both, they're both in, in television and acting, and he was arrested on child, uh, charges of child pornography, and she decided to stay with her husband, and and then not just stay, you know, not just sort of a private thing, but then she made a play and went off Broadway and you know, was doing this play. So I was commenting on that, on that what I thought was a gutsy story to run. You know, people have strong feelings about child abuse, um, and so I was privileged to get to know you briefly there, and I was curious if you might share a little bit about how you have the freedom to what the culture is like at PBS and in the newsrooms where you've worked, where you uh, seem to have the freedom to take some risks and, and run stories and not take sides. Yeah, I think that not taking sides is actually easier than you'd imagine because once you have kind of a respect and an understanding for your viewers' intellectual capacity, then I kind of know that the average PBS viewer, NPR listener has a greater tolerance for cognitive dissonance. I mean, they can reconcile an idea from their reality without having to throw something at the television, right? So I think a lot of times um, it's been profitable to have these affir affirmative echo chambers in cable television that help you articulate how you already feel and get you nodding in agreement saying, yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. And, you know, really arm you so that the next time you're at a social gathering, uh, virtual or real, um, you know, you really are, you're ready to go and take on that member of your family or your coworker who always has a political opinion different than you. Well, that's different at PBS. I mean, it's structurally fundamentally different in that I just think that it doesn't serve my audience to tell them what to think or how to think or affirm their existing viewpoints. It's more beneficial for them when they're given an opportunity to look at just slightly different perspectives on something and make up their own mind. I mean, I think my audience is pretty intelligent. And I mean, our like surveys tell us that, but I just think that so that so for me, like not taking sides about things. I mean, look, I, I'm still trying to be fair about it. I'm not trying to be sort of falsely equivalent, right? I, I'm not interviewing climate science deniers. I think the science is there. And so it, it's we're not um I think we're just we're just kind of in the service business. And I think that if we continue if we can continue that way, um we'll be around. I want to ask you a little bit about um Growing up in, and how you became a journalist. I mean, um, it, our son is 15 years old now and, and at times, so he's been reading the newspaper. We get the print version of Washington Post we have for probably 15 years, all of his life. And so it's at the 
breakfast table in the morning, every morning. And just recently, we we're just dealing with, you know, as, as parents, we're dealing with how do we help our kids be less anxious as so many, so many parents are dealing with. Well, maybe we don't read um, the A section cover to cover in the morning. I mean, that's hard for an adult sometimes if you don't have a job to do with some of that information. Um, so that we, you know, easy, easy thing to do for our son. But you had a relationship perhaps, I think, to the news also when you were young. Yeah, you know, when we immigrated to the country, uh, I was maybe second, third grade, I think. And so I was uh, the code switcher for the family and I was the translator. So my parents knew English, but it was um, much poorer than how quickly I was picking up English, right? So especially colloquialisms, et cetera. I mean, that, that I was getting that on the playground that they weren't. And eventually we got into a ritual where we would watch World News Tonight with Peter Jennings and the local news that came after it or before it. And I would essentially be sitting kind of next to the TV and translating in near real time for any key points that they might have missed or sometimes the entire story. So it was, you know, Peter Jennings was in our house and reading us the news every day. And I never in my wildest dreams would have imagined at that time that I would have a job similar to, or nor that I would, that I would meet him and work with him. So um, that turned out to be a, a pleasure, but it, yeah, so that's technically like, I guess my first <laughs> broadcast was a very narrow cast to an audience of two. Yeah, yeah. And you it, you did some broadcasting um, before becoming a journalist? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I had worked in high school radio for a number of years. Uh, it's just a station, their station existed inside the high school. And mm. it was basically a place to like, go play music in a soundproof room really loud. <laughs> and that's what sort of drew a bunch of kids to the program. And then we got to kind of basically become disc jockeys um, back when, well, there were uh, eight, four tracks and eight tracks and, and discs. And so, um, so yeah, but it was, it was fun. And then, you know, I started to realize like, you know, there's kind of something fun here that you have a relationship with an audience through a microphone and you are talking to callers and yeah, maybe I could do this for a while. And then I got to college and started taking a lot of uh, common theory courses. And we were also kind of really taking apart television and tabloid television at the time. And I just started to realize like, well, you know, these are just mediums and they're just tools and it's what you do with them that matters. And you know, at the time there was Morton Downey Jr., this loudmouth, crazy, you know, the, you know, chair throwing kind of show on TV, and and you also had Discovery and PBS and National Geographic, and I was like, well, what could I do here? I, I didn't. My intention was not to work at PBS per se, but it it kind of. Uh, the thing that I started to do in college, and it was to intern in newsrooms, and that gave me the bug. I mean, that was where I started to realize, like, you know, in, in high school, I had written for the paper and I had fun doing it and I had an op-ed column and I could report. In middle school, I was re reporting for the paper and I interviewed the mayor of Seattle. And that was, it was kind of, it hadn't really occurred to me that the thing that I kept gravitating back towards was curiosity, like journalism gives you a license to stay curious mm. and I don't know where I'd be without that license. Mm. It sounds familiar to the work I do. I mean, I've, I found myself saying that many times it's a spiritual path and I don't know if, I don't know if fellow journalists use that language. Um, I'm not sure I've heard that referred to for journalism, but curiosity to me is a spiritual path that it brings us into contact with something we don't know. Um, yeah, and I think it also there's there's a certain um, innate humility to it because you have to have some humility to know that there is more to learn and that maybe that some things might be unknowable, right? Those are okay. uncomfortable ideas for people. It's like, oh, I want to conquer this. I want to know that. I, I, we live in sometimes in a very absolute world. Yeah. Well, the certainties, people pay a lot of money to to build these 
or to construct certainties and predictability. And yeah. here we are and here you are helping to deconstruct that in some way or, or, or to question how are we constructing things? What, what, what is, what is real? What is true? Right. Um, you, you shared it in other publications how in, in the newsroom where you're at, if a story comes up around India, people look to you <laughs> and, you know, how there, of course, there's stereotypes and you, you speak openly about that. And of course, I'm a white guy and I'm going to ask you a question about your home country. So I'm aware of the burden of stereotypes, but I, I do want to ask you about your, your family and, 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 you know, w- whether you have fans in India, um, do you have a, you know, ever hear from people who are following you that are not in this um, country? I don't, you know, I think that I probably have listeners, viewers in India, um, because the CNN international distribution of almond porn company reaches everywhere. And so I was pleasantly surprised when an aunt of mine said, Oh yeah, we, we saw your interview with so-and-so. And I was like, what? Oh yeah. I forgot the show's over there. And, you know, and, right. um, <laughs> I mean, back in the 90s when I was on a technology program that was distributed uh, through Star Asia, I think, and it was on prime time, like Seinfeld sort of hours. And and at the time in the 90s, there was a lot of interest around tech. So, man, my grandmother would literally scream from the balcony, my grandson's going to be on TV in five minutes. Your channel better be on this, right? So, <laughs> she was great. And... Um, so I mean, besides my very close family, I don't know who watches, but I see them on Twitter every once in a while engaging. Um, this has been a really, really difficult time for uh, for my relatives there, but also the entire country. I mean, I am fortunate that none of my relatives, uh, immediate relatives, have passed, but there's not a one of them that doesn't know somebody personally who has. So hmm. I think the numbers of people who have uh, suffered through COVID and died in India is way underreported. Hmm. Um, it's really tragic that it's, um, I mean, I don't think it's a large conspiracy. I think it's just people in their own self-interest trying to create a different narrative. Yeah. But um, it's just been absolutely hellish um, and, and sadly you know it reminds me of what my neighborhood in queens and jackson heights and elmshurst uh, elmhurst went through in a year and a half ago or a year mm-hmm. and some months ago and so and, and, and you know we watched italy and then everybody yeah. here watched new york and then all of a sudden you're like wait what how could this still be happening right. at this scale you, right now this month yeah it seems like we're on the downside of this and you're seeing these reports of yeah, catastrophe. It is a sad tragedy, and our hearts go to go out to people who are who are who have experienced loss. I want to ask you about your time with Jim Lehrer. Speaking of grief and grieving, he passed away um, yeah. in 2013. Um, you you co-anchored with him for for a while, and then you became the weekend anchor on NewsHour. Um, he was cutting. I mean, Lehrer was PBS. What was it right. like working with Jim? You know, he was um, he was kind of a rudder in the newsroom. You, you sort of had a what would Jim say sort of question in the background, like well, would Jim buy this or not? Or, you know, I mean, he had his sort of uh, tenets of journalism that were published, uh, you know, uh, and just sitting around. And you kind of knew like that there you, you had to stick to them. Um, not to use anonymous sources, you know, unless it's a, a dire circumstance or, I mean, it, it was little basic things, but he was also just, um, I, I had heard that he had quite a temper in his uh, younger years. I had not worked with him at those times, but he was pretty kind to me. Um, and he was, um, just, a, you know, a pleasure to be around. Um, and it, and it was, and he had this side to him that <laughs> was, first of all, he was incredibly productive. I mean, he literally cranked out like a novel every year, mm. um, which is pretty hard to do because, you know, you have to have kind of a sense of discipline to be able to write every day for a couple of hours. And that's what he put himself to task to do on top of being on the news program. And then the other part that was a little more fun was he was really into buses. Like he used to work on a 
bus down in, in Texas. And he, you know, small local bus line, I think his dad might have run or something. And so he knew all these, he had like a bus call that he could do from memory of all these little towns in Texas. And he collected bus paraphernalia and signage of Greyhounds. I mean, his whole office was like a giant sort of bus museum. And he actually had like a barn full of bus stuff that, that I'd heard. I never went out and visited, but would have gotten along really well with Biden and his and his, his affiliation, his, his affinity for trains and Amtrak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, yeah. I mean, he was he was um, he was nice to me. He was a, a force in the newsroom. Um, I think people came to trust uh, him, which was the the kind of the end all be all in this business is if you can gain the audience's trust and maintain it over a period of years and decades. That's not easy to do. Does PBS let you uh, speak freely about other news organizations? <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know, but I don't, I mean, it, it's sort of, I think about it and I say, well, does that seem like something that, uh, you know, it, it, it is, is putting someone down helpful to me in any way? Like I also have friends or former colleagues that work in a lot of these different places. I still have people that I know that work at ABC News and people that I know that work at CBS News. And I have friends that have left from PBS and have gone to cable channels. So it's just kind of like, as I look at it as an individual on an individual level, I don't, I don't see the sort of general um, characteristics or the personality of the institutions that they work for. Right. Um, you know, so it's, I, I mean, it doesn't necessarily, I don't think PBS has any sort of an edict that I can't make a comment on X or Y, but. Well, let, I, let me, let me paint the, paint the picture a little bit more, I guess, to, to say where I'm, where I'm well, sure. going with this. Um, you know, PBS was always on in my house growing up and it, it like, it just, you know, as people, I think people joke about it being boring. Um, people, you know, <laughs> like, Sesame Street was not boring as a kid. But it yeah. has the it has the reputation. I even kind of joked to you earlier, like in my comments to you, that you know there's some sort of halo effect around it, and it, and it is because it educational and it, it is buttoned down, and it maybe doesn't have that pop or dazzle. It's certainly not um, a feed of exploding watermelons. Or my wife was show, showing me something this week about the the thing that's trending now on whatever you know feed is like two people bring their dog to the to the middle of the street, and they both they run away from the dog at the same time to see which way the dog is going to go. Like these are things that are trending. Like it's like, <laughs> do, which, which person does your dog love more? Like those are things people, like some, some news chan- you know, outlets are covering that stuff. Um, and, you know, anyway, so for whatever we want to say, there's no, I mean, there's no junk food at PBS. I think you, you said something like PBS has always been the broccoli on our plates. Um, yeah. And you know, the thing is, is, I mean, broccoli also gets a bad rap um, by, <laughs> by people like me saying things like that. I'm sure the, the broccoli growers of America are uh, livid every time that they will listen to this part of your podcast. But I, I think that, you know, look, I mean, there, again, I, I think about our place in your news diet. Um, as one part of it, right? Like you're you're not going to have nothing but us. There's you're already consuming so much information from all these other places. So, yeah. what's a place that you can trust and go to for an, a little bit of analysis, a little bit of insight on the day's events? Um, maybe talk to some of the primaries that are involved, or hear from some of the primaries that are involved. Right. Um, and that's kind of what we provide. Now, I mean, we have. Um, dared to be not boring every once in a while. And um, the, the, the results are fantastic. I mean, I think that there's, you know, different types of people are consuming um, the news hour and PBS's content in different ways, right? So there's, I mean, when you think of what you get, like uh, every citizen pays about a buck 50 into the, the fund that keeps the corporation for public broadcasting funded and a buck 50 a year, Okay, so just mm-hmm. let's just put that in perspective. I mean, I'm not right. turning this into a pledge drive, but people pay ten bucks a month for Netflix and another ten bucks or fifteen bucks a month for HBO and five bucks for Disney and five bucks for Apple, whatever, a month. Easy. Right? For a buck fifty a year, you get all of PBS, all of NPR. That means every show from like Morning Edition and All Things Considered to Nova on TV, PBS and Independent Lens and Frontline and the News Hour and Amon. I mean, it's crazy. Like it is such a steal. It's a huge value. 
yeah. And, you know, and then so when you think about like these sort of uh, these debates that come up every once in a while, we're going to defund people. I'm like, Re- really? Like we're a phenomenal public private partnership. I mean, every buck that goes into it from a taxpayer, it's like six to eight X return from other, right. you know, so it's, it's, we get a pretty um, amazing, um, uh, you know, array of, like we, we provide an enormous feast. I mean, if you look beyond the news and public affairs programming from entertainment stuff to nature, to science stuff, right? Like, and all of that is, I would say, you know, equally fact-based, but it's also really fun. Um, right. Frontline, so, Nova, those are some of my yeah. favorite programs and our son has yeah. taken on that tradition. <laughs> yeah. Enjoying mm-hmm. those. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge value. Well, that would be a good teaser for a fun fundraiser. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Get out your yeah. Here's a tote bag. Email. <laughs> I'll just put my bank account number up on the screen. Yeah. When you thank say you. This. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, I want to talk about another person you've worked with? I, I'm sorry. I, keep, I mean, I mean, in really, you, your reputation is is tremendous, I, and and yet, you know, like all of us, we we stand on the shoulder of of giants, right? So, in you know, you, you work with Judy Woodruff. She's she's uh, we could we could talk the whole segment here about her uh, history in, as a journalist, as a as a woman journalist, and the things she's said for women, spoken for about women in journalism. Um, I want to play a clip uh, for for my listeners of of Judy with the late Gwen Eiffel, who also sadly passed away in 2016. They took the bucket challenge, and they, so they were getting uh, ice water dumped on them. Members of our PBS News family, David Brooks and Mark Shields, and you guys are next. <laughs> And here to join us are some other members of our PBS family who are really only too happy to do this. Hats our staff. Up. Hats, Hats off. off. Here he goes. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Judy seems really unflappable. I mean, if you if you only watch her doing the the anchor, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, that was such a moment because um, first of all, we've not seen Gwen and Judy have that much fun together, like just as people, you know. And um, the whole setup was just hilarious. And but you're right that Judy is pretty unflappable. I mean, um, on air. Uh, she has, she's done it all. I mean, she's done long, grueling election night coverage. She's done uh, debates and she's done, I mean, there's not anything that Judy Woodruff has not accomplished already in her uh, professional career. And, you know, the thing that I think though, most of the, her colleagues are going to remember about her aren't her trophy case. It's just that she was a kind person and she is a kind person. And she's the kind of person that cares for your family members' well-being if someone's ill and, you know, just, you know, makes a phone call and talk. It's just like the kind of stuff that she didn't have to do and, but she went out of her way to do. And that I think will probably leave a much more lasting memory on most of us who worked around her um, than you know, the, her excellence as a journalist, which we just see every day. Yeah, it's it's just it's just so well established. I was I was kind of hoping you were going to say that you actually prank each other and. and <laughs> yeah. you, I don't. Yeah, we're, I've been in I've been in New York for the past seven years, so it's been a little harder, a little hard but, to no, do over Zoom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, so she's yeah she's she's phenomenal, and I mean it's been um, you know she's shepherded uh, the institution of the News Hour and. Uh, you know, and and survived um, the tragedy that was the loss of Gwen Eiffel and kind of um, kept the ship sailing. Yeah, yeah. What are some of your most notable interviews um, for you emotionally? You know, what stands out for you in your career? And maybe we should even talk about just this year, but I mean, I don't know <laughs> what, what comes to mind. Oh, um I mean, emotionally, you know, it's some amalgam of people who I met probably when I was in Texas and covering all kinds of crazy weather events. I would just be going from like an ice storm in one place to a tornado in another place and a hurricane in another place and flooding. And 
And the resilience of and the kind heartedness of neighbors helping neighbors is really what made me want to become a citizen of the United States. This was back in 2007 ish, seven to nine, is I think when I was at CBS. Um, So, yeah, that those were some of the most kind of emotional things where you just kind of get back in the car, so to speak, and say, Mm. wow, I just. I just saw somebody at like one of the lowest points in their life and they um, still have optimism and hope and that's just inspiring. So mm, mm. Um, that, so it's not necessarily one person that sticks out in that way. I mean, there've been um, conversations that I've just been kind of floored by. I mean, there was a guy, I don't even know if there's any videotape of it, but when I was at ABC news now, I had a chance to talk to a uh, philosopher named Slavoj Žižek and if you look him up Z-I-Z-E-K I mean he, he thinks on a whole different plane I mean his brain goes at warp speed and his mouth is barely keeping up I mean this guy's like spitting through his beard and it's just he's making connections left and right between things that you just did not even see coming to use it to illustrate where we are today ideologically. What's the meaning of our life? That was probably my most sort of, you know, just um, if if there was an emoji, it would just be my hair like standing on it all frizzed out like my fingers went into an electrical socket. Like that, that that still stands out. That was probably 10, almost 10 years ago, maybe. Um, Yeah, 15 years ago. And I still remember that. Yeah. It sounds like it made a big impression. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't remember what we talked about. But if I ever get to talk to him again, I'm going to be more prepared. Uh, we'll put a call out to him. There's all kinds of people I think that move you in different ways for different reasons. You know, um, uh, I've had the people who kind of intellectually feed that curiosity and kind of teach me something. Are those are those are moments where I feel like okay, this this profession is worth connecting and staying with because. I mean, my, my drill is usually like every 30 to 60 days, I kind of ask myself, like, are you getting more from the job than it is getting from you? And if the answer is yes, keep doing it. We should talk about your program in a, in a little bit. I, I'm eager to hear about some of the things you cover on Take on Fake, because w- what a timely time to have that. Um, yeah. I, I want to talk about, you know, this, this will lead right into it, actually. Let's talk about social media, because I... I, I think of myself, and this is a confession. This is, this is going to rub some people the wrong way. I kind of, I kind of am a, a, a snob when it comes to social media and I feel kind of entitled to be it. Uh, this sort of looking down kind of hater towards people who are always on social media, even though I use it, you use it. We have to use it if we're communicating with people. As a mental health professional, I kind of feel like I'm entitled to having this you know, <laughs> hater mentality. It's probably horrible. I should, you know, it's and my wife will tell you it's horrible because she has a different relationship with it than I do. But I went on your Twitter feed, so just like I got to check out Serena Vasa. I got to I got to look at the Twitter feed. So I'm you know I'm three tweets in. You know, maybe it's the PBS reputation, the halo effect. And I'm like, oh, I'm, I feel like I'm no. These are good stories. He's tweeting good stuff. I'm soaking it up. And then four tweets in, Hari. And I'm starting to tear up. And it was the story of Nav Bhatia, the Toronto Raptors super fan. It's the NBA playoffs right now, so I'm watching the playoffs. Um, and and you know, this is the tweet. It's it's a former car salesman that has never played in, coached, or broadcast a single NBA game, was included in the Hall of Fame induction with Kobe Bryant, Tim Duncan, Kevin Garnett. And I'm like, I gotta read that. So yeah. I'm I'm in on this feed. Can you help me tell the story? of Nav. Please take the time now to subscribe to The Soul of Life wherever you're listening. Give it a thumbs up or write a positive review. So, um, and and you have not known this by the time we're doing this interview, but literally this morning, about two hours ago, I spent a half an hour interviewing Nav Bhatia. And uh, so I am well prepared to answer this question. He, um, He is your traditional uh, immigrant that came, uh, he, he actually fled uh, India in 84 when there were uh, uh, you know, attacks on Sikh people there. And he came to Canada, he had trained as an engineer, took jobs as a janitor, took jobs as a landscaper, 
got a job at a car dealership. None of the colleagues, you know, respected him because he wore a turban. He outsold all of them. Uh, I want to say 129 sales and 140 sales in three months or something. Still, like holds his record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Has a record on it. And then uh, Hyundai moves him into a dealership across the way, and that was also uh, ailing. And everybody at that dealership quits because they don't want to work for a Sikh guy, an Indian guy, and. He builds it back up. He is literally one of the largest car dealers in Canada. He has five dealerships, three Hyundais and two Genesis dealerships. And this meteoric rise uh, in, in about 10 years, he's living a comfortable life, grinding it out. And the Toronto Raptors come into existence around 95. And he says, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and buy a pair of season tickets. Falls in love with the game, game one. And then he just keeps going and going and going and does not miss a home game in, what, 20 plus years, 25 plus years. And you can see him in almost every game. Like he's he's center center court. And you can see the guy waving a towel around. And in uh, a few years into this, his super fan status is literally minted by Isaiah Thomas, a Hall of Famer uh, who was running the organization at the time, who brings him out to center court, gives him a jersey, calls him the super fan. This guy is just one of those parts of the institution of the Raptors now. And so he does things like buy thousands of tickets a year Every year on uh, the sort of Sikh New Year, Vaisakhi in mid-April, and puts kids from all over, mosques and temples and uh, churches and single-parent households, everybody together to get them cheering for the Raptors and to try to build bridges. And he's been doing that for 21 years. I think he spends somewhere around like $300,000 a year on tickets. Getting goosebumps. Like the story keeps going. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he um, you know, and he still faces, I mean, he, he, so even after he got the super fan status, you know, he tells me the story about walking into a someplace to get his phone fixed. And the guy says to his wife, hey, honey, I got to go. My cab's here. Because he thought Nav was the cab driver. Right. He just looks at and the way he characterizes all these things are speed bumps. He doesn't call himself a victim of discrimination and systemic oppression. He's got an incredibly positive attitude. And, you know, he just kind of sees opportunities in, in these places. So a couple of years ago, um, pretty rude Twitter user, speaking of social media, um, had really called them out saying, oh, what's worse? You know, the Raptors or this fat guy wearing an underwear on his head and mm. Nav to his credit, says, you know, that guy was 50% right. I am fat. Um, But he he says, he, 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 you know, he actually tells all of the fans of, and supporters of his not to go after the other guy saying that that would make us just as bad as him. Don't do it. Forget about it. And you know what? We're in the playoffs. Let's focus. No sort of distractions. A couple of days later, that guy who said this tweet lives for three hours outside of Milwaukee calls now to apologize. Nav says, you know what? Only way I'm taking this apology is if I can take you and your family to a game and to dinner. Mm. Mm. Next time he's in Milwaukee, he meets the family for dinner ahead of time. All the Milwaukee fans who know about what's going on are like hugging Nav, the Raptors fan. During the game, he finds out that the kid is really in love with one of these superstars on the Milwaukee team. Nav, with his connects, makes it possible for the kid to meet that player. The kid is like in awe. The father is like overjoyed, you know, just, I mean, he just took an opportunity that any one of us would just say, "Ah, yeah, let the haters hate. And he turned it into something. And he's just, that's just, I mean, you see this guy, and that's why he was the grand marshal at the parade of the Raptors when they won the championship. And that is why he is <laughs> probably one of the first, I think there's probably going to be more, fans 
uh, you know, this guy's not even six foot tall with the turban on, never played a pro game in his life. He has a championship ring and he has an NBA Hall of Fame ring. Yeah. Good on the NBA, I have to say. Good on Smart. the NBA. Smart. I mean, look, Smart. I mean, he says, look, part of the reason that if you go to a Raptors game, you're going to see kids in hijabs and turbans and yarmulkes in the stands because they've been coming for 15 years because it's a different type of community in a club. Right. right. Good. Yeah. Smart. I mean, we need, we need more knobs. <laughs> we need them and, and we, we need to yeah. be, be that bridge in our community. Wow. It's yeah. an insp- inspiration. So I, I'm corrected. I'm, I'm, I'm chastised by your Twitter feed. <laughs> No, no. Because it's a, it's a I, great know, look, story. I, yeah. I mean, look, I think, you know, again, all these technologies, they're just tools and it's what people yeah. make of them. And it's, and it's, and what we find value in, right? So it, it's, if you choose to follow a, a bunch of uh, people who can make you better, then it's worthwhile. Absolutely. If you, I, I do think that there, it, there is, look, the algorithms, are designed to try to keep you engaged and keep you kind of entrapped in it. I mean, look, I'm having a great time with my phone down right now. So I, yeah. I, I value like phone down time during the day. Um, so it's, uh, it, you can make it be more productive for you or more kind of look, if you want to lose weight, there's phenomenally yeah. inspiring people who are doing great exercise videos all over it. Right. And yeah. And then there's also people who will um, help you in a downward spiral, um, just keep eating more um, because there's all these baked good recipes that I watch, right? So there's, <laughs> it just depends on what you want to do with it. Exactly. It's a tool. And, you know, we have to be aware that it's a tool. Otherwise, we're the tool, I guess. Yeah. Um, we talked, a, you mentioned a little bit of you know, race um, earlier, you know, we're talking about ethnicity and, you know, it's still in our country. Obviously it's come to the fore. And I would say, thankfully, even though it's, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's easy for me to say as a white person, thankfully, right. It's, it's with, with a lot of, um, pain that, that these issues are coming to the fore and causing a lot of upset and discomfort. But, you know, we no longer laugh, you know, it's no, it's no longer acceptable in mainstream American comedy to laugh at African Americans, it used to be Archie Archie Bunker, right? Mainstream comedy laughing at black people. Mm. It's it's still like up like today. It's still okay to laugh at Asian Americans or Asians in mm. our culture. We like the the character from The Simpsons, Abu. Uh, oh yeah, the yeah. the actor Frank Azaria just just apologized. He came out and he said, 30 years I've been playing this role." And I, I didn't realize it was like, it was like the Beastie Boys when, with their apology about being misogynist. <laughs> and it's like, you know, it, it's, it's late, but it's, um, coming out to say, I recognize this was, this is, this character has caused pain for people. Um, are we witnessing a genuine move toward more sensitivity about privilege and power? Um, are you experiencing this or are we still a long way off? Uh, look, I think some of it, I mean, I, I applaud Hank Azaria for doing that. I also applaud. Hari Kondabolu for making the documentary about the Simpsons that really got this conversation going. Uh, the way that some of the writers behind the show initially reacted wasn't very smart, but you know, uh, like when you see a cultural icon like a program, with the Simpsons, I mean, the Simpsons has been around for a long time now, yeah. and it has helped frame. Uh, the edge of acceptability for a couple of generations. Um, so, you know, I, I think that some of the some of the reactions that have been happening in the past year are genuine, and I think some are performative. I mean, if you get into kind of what makes, for example, like uh, corporate responses to either the Black Lives Matter movement or to a particular killing, I'm like, well, how are you backing that up? I mean, it's great for you to make a public relations statement and sign on a line, but what are you doing to increase diversity and equity and inclusion in your companies? And how does your C-suite look? And what kinds of... It's just there. there's a lot that I am optimistic for and I'm hopeful that this change becomes more deep-seated 
Yeah, I know that there's a lot of like deep structural work that needs to be done to, uh, you know, I, I mean, we have 18,000 police jurisdictions in America. And I will tell you that I would, I would bet you money that there are um, phenomenal uh, uh, police officers who got into this to help people and who want to save lives every day. And I thank them for their efforts. And I, you know, have no ill will towards, I don't know, 90 plus percent of police. And then there's, we just hear repeatedly about bad apple after bad apple after bad apple. And at some point you kind of say, well, where, where are all those good police officers that I know exist? Why aren't they intervening? Why aren't they the ones that are stepping in and saying, hey, man, this isn't right. We can't do this, right? So it's the kind of the, the culture of policing, I think, is uh, rightfully in question. Mm -hmm. um, that's separate from kind of funding um, and resources. And, and I think that that's, it's a conversation that's overdue. I mean, I don't think that the crimes being committed by police have necessarily increased in the past five years years, I think we've just seen them more. So I think if you have African-American friends, they've been telling you driving while black has been a problem for a long time. Mm -hmm. Now we have body cam. Exactly. Look, I mean, I've, I've had uh, police pull guns on me, laid spread eagle when I was in high school a couple of different times, uh, one uh, outside of a mall and once uh, at my outside my own home and you know but uh, at the time i didn't really think about the structures involved now i'm a little smarter and wiser and i said well what kinds of implicit bias are there uh, based on the neighborhood that i lived in or what kinds of um you know what kinds of training that these people have what kind of assumptions that they have had they had any exposure to someone like me before um what did they what were their preconceived notions of who i was and how does that influence the task that they have at hand, right? There's just, I mean, even, you know, sort of even besides policing, I think that when you look at the, you know, the structural ways that whether it's our tax system and the, the, the real estate discounts, I mean, it's just lots and lots of ways where it is really difficult. But that's also, you know, you can look at a problem and say, this is horrible and we're, it's never going to get better. Or you can also see the opportunity to solve that problem. So, I, I, th I mean, I, I have to stay optimistic and have to see the opportunity. Otherwise, it's just a really depressing reality to get yourself mired in. Um, can, can you say more about your, your YouTube channel or any other projects yeah. you want to tell people about? Yeah, so, I mean, so, um, yeah, the YouTube channel was born in the middle of the pandemic, really. I mean, we thought about doing something around misinformation and disinformation, and we were thinking about it kind of two years ago and really in the context of like election related. And then we just realized that the ecosystem of, you know, amplification of misinformation and disinformation, the profitability that there exists. And then, you know, we were sort of overwhelmed, like, how do we get tackle this? And then we said, okay, look, how about we just try to figure out how to make people smarter? How about we figure out how to show others the type of work that journalists perform to help us fact check something? And if people watch one of these or two of these or maybe all of these or whatever, they'll get a little bit more of an idea on how to be better consumers of news and information. And that, that'll be our goal. So, so we did one season and one of our episodes uh, with Laura Garcia from First Draft News won an, a Webby Award, um, which in the internet is like the Oscars or the Emmys or whatever. Um, and then, uh, so we just started season two when we rolled out Take on Fake on Instagram as well. And so we're building up more um, work and we just we're just trying to help people get just this much smarter before they you know press share or press forward or um because look i mean again the, the the systems on the social platforms are meant to reward engagement and engagement usually means just you doing something to stay on the app. That doesn't mean you necessarily have to like something. Mm -hmm. It just means something you could, you could be hating something and commenting, but you're still commenting. I mean, like, and you I, know, read the articles before forwarding them. How about totally. that? <laughs> totally. And, and so I think that there's, look, I mean, a people design 
<laughs> you're being played. Like mm-hmm. you are a pawn in somebody else's machine. Like they want you to be enraged about something. And so they'll come up with a phenomenally clickbaity headline and get you fired up. Ah, it sucks. Well, guess what? Every time that that, I mean, it's, it's almost like going back to sort of Daniel Tiger, the wisdom of Daniel Tiger and says, you know, when you get so mad that you want to roar, take a deep breath and count to four. I mean, yes. that guy is profound. <laughs> so, you know, it's like if, if it works for a four-year-old, like this, is, you're, you're being game just like a child because they want you to be enraged. And so people should watch the, the social dilemma. I think that's what it's called. Yeah, yeah. Fact, yeah, I interviewed yeah. The, 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 the folks, the documentarian oh, and the, yeah, the primary. Tristan Harris. Tristan Harris. Tristan yeah. Harris. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, so it, it's that dopamine hit that we get, that we're yeah. getting addicted to. So it's good to put down your phone. It's good to recognize that this, this, this isn't, you know, like your body reacting, yeah. uh, your blood pressure going up, your anxiety levels, adrenaline. your cortisol levels, yeah. your adrenaline, right? This is crazy. It's all from like a little tweet that you read. Yeah. And it's happening dozens of times a day. Not good. Not, Not good. good for our bodies. Not good. Yeah, it's, it's a the formula for depression, which is something I talk about on my show. I talk about my own relationship to depression, which I'm hoping to raise awareness of. You know, just that uh, we ha- there's like just so many flavors of it. I think it's a terrible word because people a- attribute to that some sort of clinical um, out there sort of like somebody's in a bed and they're not getting out of bed and they just can't do anything. And that's what depression looks. I don't have that. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it takes so many forms and I, we probably have a, a half a dozen depressions blow through us like weather systems in, during our, our normal day on a good day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's why for me, like a vacation is actual no phone at all time. Like there's yeah. very few, few places and times that you can actually just be completely disconnected. And it actually takes me at least a day and a half or so to go through my little withdrawals and then to be, you know, just to be. I mean, there was actually, I was having another conversation this morning, another interview with Dr. Becky Kennedy, uh, uh, who's on Instagram and has lots of followers about uh, child psychology and so forth. And, and she said, you know, there's, there's doers and, and there's people who do and there's people who be and, and, and who can be and, and mm-hmm. people who can do and people who can be. And, it's hard for us to just be and um, the anxieties around COVID, the uh, lots of different anxieties around social media, et cetera. Like you want to just accomplish something. You want to do something. You want to get something. I was like, eh. you know, like in, in Eastern philosophy has tried for so long, whether it's Buddhism or Hinduism, uh, the practices of meditation, of just being still and being present is really hard in this era where we're constantly stimulated and we're penalized if we're not responsive to that stimulation. And, you know, so if, if when I do get a chance to go away or be on vacation, I really just like, I don't want to touch the internet. I don't really want to use a Mm -hmm. phone if I don't have to. Yeah. You get sensitized to it. It's like when you've gone on a long, long hike, my son and I did the grand Canyon and uh, rim to rim to rim. And Wow. When you're riding in a car afterwards, you're like, we are moving. Like yeah. because your 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 sense of scale changes when you're just clicking and clicking and clicking. And then, I'm like, yeah, take a vacation. Mindfulness happens in so many forms, and that's a great. It's, we do it. We can do it. Brushing your teeth, you can do it by being a mindful eater. I'm yeah. a big fan. Big yeah. fan. And I'm a big fan of yours, Hari Srinivasan. I'm so <laughs> grateful to you. Your uh, YouTube channel is Take on Fake. People can see you on the weekend edition of News Hour. Really appreciate your time. Thanks, Keith. Thanks so much. Hey, I've started a community for Soul of Life fans interested in talking about episodes or getting more information about some of my teaching on IFS, mindfulness, and relationship growth. Head on over to community.souloflifeshow to get access to this group of really cool people just like you who care about the show and want to talk about episodes or or hear more, get access to courses and and support each other through life. That's what this is all about. Please leave an iTunes rating for the show and subscribe now wherever you listen to get more soul in your life. I like it and it's not harsh to my eardrum. All right, I will go.